satellites do exist. Okay, but I'm of, of I am of the belief and understanding that there is no possible way that anything weighing over a ton is being put in the nose cone of any rocket. I don't give a shit how powerful the rocket is. I done, I put out videos, you know, um, explaining to you guys what Don Pettit, NASA astronaut and PhD, who talks about the tyranny of the rocket equation. I put this out, and he explains. I don't explain it to you, but he explains how it is dumb mass, meaning extra weight and material and scientific instruments, literally affects the entire performance of a particular rocket based on the amount of fuel it needs to have on board to do what it needs to do. But there's no way, I don't give a shit what type of physics science that they're, they're engaging in, in mathematics. There's no way they're sending something up in the sky on a rocket that weighs over a ton and allowing it to maintain its aerodynamic stability and remain control and stay and stay in control where that rocket is not spinning out of control and basically exploding in the sky. So based on that hypothesis, I'm going to reveal this document to you guys to show you. There ain't nothing in the fucking nose codes of those rockets. The entire satellite program worldwide, worldwide, okay, worldwide is a balloon program. And it's been in existence longer than fucking rockets, period. And I'm going to show that to you. So first document we're going to read. Here's the document. Just like I said, it is the title of it is telling in of itself. Space and Missile Systems Center. Okay, space and missile systems. Now, the term space, what does that mean? They, they have a general international presumption of where space begins. The U.S. Department of Defense classifies and, and categorizes space to begin at 80 kilometers. That's about 262,000 plus feet above the surface, center surface of the Earth. That means the flat plane surface that we live on, you launch a rocket, boom, 262,000 plus feet above the surface of the earth. That's U.S. DOD standard. So according to the DOD, they got aircraft that could fly close to that, maybe half the distance. But the international standard is called what they call the Kármán line. Theodor von Kármán developed him and a bunch of physicists and scientists from all over the world, including scientists from the United States, established in the 1940s that space actually begins at 100 kilometers. For those in the United States, that converts to 328,082 3, feet above the surface of the Earth, okay? That is where actual space begins. Now, what is space? We can, we can have several definitions of what space is. We don't fucking know. They're still studying it as we speak. So space definitely that at that altitude, even at DOD standard, we got a serious lack of oxygen and all of the components and pressure and environments that are consistent on the surface plane of the Earth. Okay? So in space, you have limited to almost zero aerodynamic control, astronomic control. You need some sort of vehicle that has to travel at ultra high speeds beyond, well beyond the speed of sound, which is 700 and I think 60 miles per hour, okay? It has to be traveling at high speed, you know, for it to maintain any sort of aerodynamic stability and function and control at those altitudes. So, Space and Missile System Center. This is an interview with Lieutenant Colonel Harold E. Mitchell for the Corona Program. Now, let me dive in about the Corona Program. The Corona Program, okay, the Corona program is still a top secret program. It was a program launched by the National Reconnaissance Office in conjunction with the CIA. It's supposed to, it, it's equipped with some very advanced optical equipment and photographic equipment to conduct mapping and, and reconnaissance uh, intelligence gathering capabilities, okay? So I have that document pulled up here for you guys that we're gonna reference. We're gonna need that program. 
So this is a letter actually drafted uh, August 21st, 1964, regarding a corona mission. Now, I need you to understand this. There were several corona missions. So this is the importance behind proving that this satellite was never launched on a rocket. They had several missions. This satellite was put up on a gondola balloon. It did its thing for however many days or months. And then it was captured by a C-119 multi-engine turboprop U.S. Air Force cargo plane, specially outfitted to capture this thing on a, to capture it using some sort of tail hook type of device, okay? So I'm not going to read this entire document, but there's specific sections of this document we're going to address so I can prove to you guys that satellites are not floating around above a hundred and maybe a hundred, two hundred thousand feet. They are literally 10 to maybe 50,000 feet above the altitude where you two optimal flight range is. So, and I'll show that to you as well. The technical specs for you two, they can go beyond 70,000 feet. Okay. Beyond 70,000 feet. That's not their max operating altitude. They can go beyond that. Okay. Now, the reason why I chose this document is for the one simple reason. Although this activity occurred between 1954 and 1956, and Corona program is 1958 to 1962, the subject time frame involves about 20 years, 23, 23 years. But look at the date of the interview, people. The date of the interview was October 1st of 2003. Now, what significant does that play? One, it's, to me, it's fairly recent. Even though this is 2016, that's 13 years, okay? This, re this document was recently declassified as an interview, but it's also interesting to note that it was conducted by the Space and Missile Systems Center. So Robert McCulley was the, uh, of the history office at the Space and Missile Centers at Los Angeles Air Force Base. So this guy is going to interview Lieutenant Colonel Harold E. Mitchell of Missouri over the telephone about his experiences recovering Corona satellites. All right, I'm going to skip forward because he just talks about the guy's history, where he got his training, how long he's been doing his training. You know, this is just basically, you know, uh, introductory type of, okay, this is who this guy is. I need to know who he is. Let's, okay, now let's get to the meat of what, what it is he was doing and what his role was in this program. So they talk about what his rank was. This guy was a captain. He was in charge in 1954. He was part of the Dragnet program, also known as the Genetrix program or weapon system. 119L came along. They were flying out of Charleston, Car Charleston, South Carolina. That's where they were doing a lot of their training. They were flying a C-119. You saw a brief picture of what that looks like. It says, how did you conduct your training? They talk about how they were conducting their training. Again, a lot of this information, it's not insignificant, but it just adds to the narrative of, you know, is he talking to the right guy? All right? Um, all right. So here's some of the, the beginning meat of this interview. Macaulay asked Mitchell, Captain Mitchell, did you ever recover the Dragnet training capsules at night? Mitchell says, it's impossible to recover at night. The only time we flew at night was during our instrument training. We didn't fly our emergency training at night either. We did all of our training instrument flying 16 hours a day. We did that because time was of the essence. And if we didn't fly night missions, we'd never get all the training done to get people ready to go into the practice sessions. Okay? So let's go ahead and. Now, here's where he describes what the dragnet gondola looked like. What did, the, what did a dragnet gondola look like? Well, we use similar parachutes except the Corona program or Discoverer program only used one chute, okay? We used four 28 parachutes, 28 foot parachutes for a dragnet gondola and they did all of the chute modification at the parachute shop. They would attach four parachutes and then, and, and these were not reinforced parachutes. They were just to lower the load, the gondola, You'd attach them to the gondola and then from the middle of this on a longer tether, you would have a smaller chute that we call the drogue chute. I think the drogue chute was 100 feet above the four descent chutes and the drogue chute was reinforced. We could make our passes on that drogue chute. 
When they say they can make their passes on that drogue shoot, you're looking at a 100-foot tether. And what would happen is that the drogue shoot with the ploy, you got a 100-foot of tether. The plane didn't need to come within a, a, a dangerous distance of the shoot as the as the the, the 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 satellite was falling from the sky and they'd be able they'd have a hook at the back of the aircraft that would fly by and hook this chute and once they hooked it they start reeling it into the back of the aircraft here's some important data the top of the gondola the top of the gondola had a compartment for the chutes and all that stuff and a lot of it had to be the parachutes but the whole capsule was 1,450 pounds when it was airlifted, okay? The capsule they're talking about is literally the satellite. The gondola had, a, now I want you to pay attention to this. He says, he's, he's, this is Mitchell, Captain Mitchell talking. Captain Mitchell says the gondola had a huge balloon. I mean a huge balloon. You could see it at 60,000 to 85,000 feet. Now, this supports what I've been telling all of you that NASA has had a balloon program literally for decades, decades, over, as long as they've been in existence. Some of these balloons are the size of a football field. When you look at the size of a football field, 100 yards long, 50 yards wide, just imagine what that looks like up in the sky. Think about what a balloon that size could lift off the ground, okay? Now, Macaulay says, did you ever see a Genetrix balloon get inflated and then lift off? Did you see that process? Mitchell says, one. Mitchell says once, but I didn't see the beginning of it. I saw it when it was about three quarters filled and then the lift off. Now, this was only in the training phase of our operation in the summer of 1955, and that was done in Denver, Colorado at Lowry Air Force Base. The one that I watched launch, they had to put the capsule on a forklift and I imagine this was done before the balloon was attached and inflated. At any rate, they started their inflation. And then as the balloon got full enough to support itself and go airborne, they'd run down a taxiway with the forklift, carrying the gondola until the balloon had enough lift to get the gondola airborne. I want to show all of you what that actually looks like in real time. Now, when I say real time, okay, when I say real time, I'm talking to you, this is a launch that had already occurred in Antarctica. This is a launch that already occurred in Antarctica, and I'm going to show it to you. And here we go. This is, I just read this to you. This balloon launch took place in Antarctica, and it's an 8,000 fucking pound telescope satellite. There goes the mountains in the background. Here's a visual description of what I just read in that document. On a taxiway and getting it aloft and launching it. Watch what happens. If you like apples, how you like them fucking apples? That's 8,000 fucking pounds, people. 8,000 pounds. That dome on the top, that dome on the top is actually where all of the radio equipment is installed so that the C-130, so that a C-130 can communicate with it. It sends off a signal so that when these aircraft are in the air, they can detect the signal why it's up at 85,000 feet, 100,000 feet. Today's balloons get to about 130, 150, 180,000 feet, okay? And at nighttime, when the helium air is cooled down, the, 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 the balloon drops in altitude about 10,000 feet, maybe 5,000 feet. And then when the sun shines back up on it again, that hot helium air expands in the balloon, raises in altitude again. So you have this oscillation of losing altitude, gaining altitude, losing altitude, gaining altitude. Now, for anybody that hasn't paid close attention to what the ISS is doing, 
The ISS is doing the same fucking thing that balloons do. And I'm going to prove that to you as well, that the ISS, if it exists, which now I'm of the, of the notion, conclusion that it does exist, that means that the ISS is up in the sky. It's not at 245 miles. It's within, say, 150, maybe 250,000 feet. And to prove to you where that site location is, this is Google Earth Pro. This is December 15th of 2009. Okay? This is Antarctica. Antarctica people. On the other side of Antarctica, this is the launch site for the balloons. It's called the Wallop Program. Based on the satellite imagery, you have these large cranes out there, okay? The launch site for the balloons. Further proof that they're using aircraft to capture these things down in Antarctica, this. Here goes your C-130s, C-7, these, these are your C-130s, these are your C-119s. prop planes, and if anybody wants to say, oh, well, they're using this to transport people back and forth. Yeah, they are using people to transport back and forth, but guess what? These are also specially outfitted aircraft to literally recover when the when they pop when they intentionally burst the balloon, it comes down on a drone shoot, a drogue shoot, and these aircraft fly at at uh, 20, 30,000 feet, and they go and grab this thing. There's your aircraft. Five. You have a sixth over here. This is for crew transportation, but these big boys right here, these Hercules. These Hercules are the ones that are recovering 8,000 pound telescope satellites launched from Antarctica. The document, because this document gets better. Now, Macaulay says, did the gondola lift off pretty quickly after it was inflated? Mitchell says, yeah, once it was inflated with the helium it carried, that balloon was designed to go during the day to about 85,000 feet. Now, this is back in 1954, people. Today's balloons get, well, almost three times this altitude, okay? Maybe two and a half times. And as nighttime came and the gas cooled down, it would come down to around 60,000 feet to 65,000 feet. So it went, it dropped almost 20,000 feet in altitude in the evening time, okay? In the evening time. So I want you guys to picture this, okay? There are people online um, who they they're so in love with NASA they will tell us all these trolls will say no I've seen satellites myself they'll say no I've seen satellites myself I've seen it in my telescope I've seen the Hubble I've seen the space station I've seen a satellite pass over you're looking at the Hubble and the ISS floating around in the thermosphere moving at high speeds because the hot air up there moves at high speeds very high speeds. How fast the speeds are, who knows? But we know, we know this for a fact. The higher you go, the faster you have to go, right? The higher you go, the faster you have to go if you're using an aerodynamic vehicle. Now, Macaulay says, do you know how long the balloon floated over the U.S. before they were usually recovered? Mitchell says, it varied with the flight path. We tried to recover them before they left the continental limits of the United States. We had one balloon that went into the jet stream and flew east during our training period. I believe that it took off in July 1955. We deployed an airplane and he went to Goose Bay, Newfoundland, refueled and headed for the Azores. I believe there was an, there were an, one another one or two airplanes from other, other squadrons too. He says the balloon was finally terminated someplace over the area of the Azores. I don't think that capsule was ever recovered. I couldn't say for sure. Macaulay says, recovering a discovery parachute must have been easy compared to the to a gingerous gondola. Mitchell says, it was. Discover was much easier once we resolved the problems and they designed the right parachute and equipment to recover it with. Actually, when you do area recovery every day, it's a piece of cake, easy. It was fun. Each recovery aircrew had to airily recover five dragnet parachutes after we'd complete our aerial recovery phase 
we went up to an airfield at Georgetown, South Carolina. Ground crews would use drums of water to simulate the gondolas for surface recovery. Oh, look at what he says here. He says, during the genetrics program, we operated under the Strategic Air Command. To show you how important genetrics was to the Strategic Air Command, we, pilot, we pilots each carried a letter in our, in our secret folder along with our top secret aircraft equipment. It was a letter from the Director of Operations for Headquarters, SAC, his name was Brigadier General Howard Smith, to the commander of any SAC base where we had to land, that we had the number one priority over anything else in refueling, maintenance, and getting our aircraft back airborne. Now, why would they have number one priority to refuel and get airborne again? Let's, let's, let's assess that. Well, if there's hundreds or thousands of these satellites supposedly in space floating around and we know now they were balloons and these things suffer some sort of malfunction and they come down that airplane has got to go to that location to recover that thing these airplanes had to be available non-stop to go anywhere at any time to recover this thing and it had to be recovered once they got notification, hey, the balloon just popped, drogue shoot, we need an aircraft up in the air immediately. They couldn't get to one of these satellites fast enough, and it actually crashed somewhere in a foreign country, and I'm going to read that document to you of what happened to it. So he says, you had a terrible time getting refuel maintenance or anything just to get out. On the way to California on that particular trip, I had to go from Greenville and refuel at Salina, Kansas, Smoky Hill. Uh, let's see here. Okay, here's where they talk about getting in contact with one of the balloons. I then flew into Castle Air Force Base on Friday night. The next morning, we checked into the command post. The balloon had started traveling to the west, and they were concerned about it. So they scrambled us, and we started tracking after it. Each one of these balloons transmitted their own identification signal. By the time we made contact with the balloon, we were about 310 miles at sea, west of San Francisco. I didn't like us being out there by ourselves, especially making aerial recovery. At about 85,000 feet, after you sighted a balloon, you'd interrogate it. The balloon's radio signal would give, give you its code name or code number. If you wanted to terminate its flight, you had a black box up on the flight deck at the navigator station. He would dial in the code of the balloon we were trying to track, and the balloon would come back and answer. Then if we had clearance, from the Charleston Air Force Base command post to bring the balloon down, we would insert another code. This then would ignite a blast from the gondola that would burst the balloon. After we terminated the flight of the balloon, here's what they say. It would do very much the same as the discoverer did. It would fall so far and then the drogue chute would come out. The chute would slow it down until it was at an acceptable altitude and airspeed. And then the parachute would get fully deployed. It was late, listen to this people, it was late in the evening when they authorized me to terminate the balloon. Macaulay says, once you recovered this gondola, what happened to it at that point? Mitchell says, we made the recovery on it, brought it back in. We were very low on fuel. I told them I was going to Castle Air, For or Air Force Base to refuel. Then they deployed us to Ophid Air Force Base, Nebraska, where we delivered the capsule there. Where it gets interesting for me. After you, McCauley says, after you landed at Ophid Air Force Base to drop the gondola off, how did they unload it and take it away? Mitchell says, they sent people out and it was offloaded. Where they took it to and what they did with it afterwards, we didn't know. That was not our mission. Dragnet was a top secret operation, gondola and all. The only thing that we were concerned with were the people who were not connected with the program that they had no opportunity to see the gondola, so we carried sidearms. You hear that? They didn't want people to see this thing. So they, they were always strapped, ready to go, that if someone were to see one of these things, they had to deal with that person. Now, this was back in 1954. You bet your ass the same thing is happening today. They don't want nobody seeing the Hubble come down on a parachute. They don't want to see it. They don't want to see parts of the space station, which is in modules, detach, come down on a parachute, get captured by one of these 
these C-119s or C-130s taken down to Antarctica at the Concordia station. And just to remind people and to redress this, Concordia station, NASA classifies it as a hypoxic environment. Okay? They said the conditions at Concordia are more severe than being on the ISS. So when astronauts, astronauts actually are sent down there for cold weather training in the most extreme environment on Earth. How could there be a place at about 8,000 feet above sea level be more extreme than being at 245 miles above the surface of the Earth, supposedly in microgravity? And I thought to myself, wait a minute. The ISS is definitely not at 245 miles. Because if I can go to Concordia Station in Antarctica and literally be in worse conditions than being on ISS, then ISS conclusively has to be around 150, 160,000 feet. Let's keep going on. So this guy goes on and he says that, and this is what's interesting about this. He says he, he had an instrument problem on the airplane at Ofer Air Force Base and the people came out to refuel the plane. I filed back. I filed to come back to Charleston as soon as they offloaded the gondola. This was on a Sunday morning, and I'd gotten in there late Saturday night. The base operations officer said he was going to come aboard. He wanted to check Form 21A, which is my maintenance form. I lost in an in inverter, and I had a bad generator, but I didn't want to fool around and stay at Offutt Air Force Base on a weekend trying to get it repaired. So... While this guy's at this base, this captain, okay, some lieutenant colonel, he says he was a lieutenant colonel, and he tried to come on board our airplane, and here's what happened. The captain, Mitchell, says, he says, I said, I'm sorry, you're not allowed on board. This lieutenant colonel stepped up the ladder and started explaining that he was a silver leaf, a lieutenant colonel, and I was wearing tracks, a captain. About that time, he heard the rifle bolt of a carbine, carbine slide home, load its ammunition. My crew chief was standing there with his carbine down at his hip, so that the lieutenant colonel, so the lieutenant colonel decided not to come on board. He decided prudence was better, part of valor. So you see that? This guy's a captain. He tells the lieutenant colonel, "Sir, I'm sorry, you can't come on board. I'll come down to show you my form 21A." but you can't come on board. This lieutenant colonel says, excuse me, but I'm a lieutenant colonel and you're a captain. I can come on board. And one of this guy's crew chief says, I don't think so. He chambered around. The lieutenant colonel said that. And he's like, okay, no harm, no foul. Uh, let me know when you come down and show me the form. I mean, come on, people. You're talking about an Air Force pilot Top secret security clearance, maybe higher. And they got authorization to kill one of their own people. If security is breached, this guy's not even supposed to know what the hell is inside that aircraft. They were ready to shoot him. That's what you got to deal with. So, and Macaulay says, did the Genetrix gun dollar drop a capsule like the Discoverer did? Mitchell says, no, the gondola hung below the four 27-foot, 24-foot chutes. When you shoot the balloon down, all these parachutes packed on the top of the gondola deployed. The gondola will start then falling to the earth. He says, so, you recovered the entire gondola. He says, you caught the whole thing. You caught everything except the balloon, and it was quite a load. Error recovery really was kind of a hairy operation because you're flying at such low speeds. We were especially low on fuel that night. We had to fly at, a, at about 115 to 120 knots just to keep our airspeed up. And with the beaver tail door open and the recovery poles and cables hanging out of the back of the end of the airplane, it took quite a bit of power using quite a bit of fuel. So again, these guys are recovering things that are thousands of pounds, half a ton, a ton or more. They have to fly at low speeds just to capture the damn thing and make sure they don't rip the tether apart and lose the damn satellite. So once they capture it, they got to start reeling it in and they got to maintain altitude and power, which uses up a lot of fuel just to stay in flight. 
and then they beat feet out of it and get the hell out of it and take it to where it needs to go. So here, here's some descriptions of where they actually have these aircraft launching these balloons. He says, once our genetics training was completed and airplanes were put in top maintenance condition, we deployed to our pre-designated bases in November of 1955. We had three squadrons in the 456 TCW and they split each squ squadron right down the middle into six detachments. Our squadron, we were the 746 troop carrier squadron and our detachment was deployed to Kodiak, Alaska. The 745th squadron went to ADAC, Naval Air Station, Alaska, and the other detachment was sent to Japan at Johnson, Misawa, Itaziku. Another squadron was sent to Kadena, Kadena, Okinawa. Our headquarters was just was at Johnson Air Force Base. They had these everywhere, people. They had them in Germany. They had them in Sweden. All right. They even had some in Russia. Russia. So let me see here. I'm going to take you to the part where they talk about the U2 program, how U2 actually replaced them. Let me see here. Okay, here we go. They said that night the winds got up to, this is when they were in Alaska, he says the, the, the winds got up to 100 miles an hour. It sandblasted the airplane, absolutely sandblasted the paint off of it. About the 1st of April, <coughs> the U-2 started flying, so our missions were over about the 1st of April, 1956. Okay? I'm going to show you Lockheed's site so we can look at U-2 and do a little brief technical descriptive analysis of you two. Macaulay says, when you were flying out out there looking for gondolas, were you both visually looking for them and listening to your radios for their signals? Mitchell says, we were doing both. In Alaska, the daylight hours are pretty short in wintertime. So they would give us the codes of the balloons that were flying in our area. The navigator would continually monitor the different codes with the ADF, the Air Direction Finder radio. The balloons had ADF beacons that we could come come home in on. Each balloon had its own frequency. We would sit there and the navigator would keep scanning these different frequencies that we would get for that particular mission. Now, think about this, people. You have amateur radio operators out there all around the world who says that they can track the signals from satellite communications. Now, I'm not doubting they, can't, they can track satellite communication signals. But let's be clear. What we've all been led to believe what a satellite is, is something that is so far advanced and technically incredible that it's floating around up there on its own. We see these on videos. We see this on television. Oh, look at this satellite. It's always a CGI photo or video or some sort of artist rendition of what the satellite looks like. It's the drawing. Every single video we've all ever seen, they're all CGI videos and images of satellites. They never show you something in real time. Why can't they show you in real time? Because it's not where they say it is. But what is up there is a real satellite, but it's not at the altitude they claim it is. It is giving off a frequency and signature. It is floating in the sky, but not unaided. You only see it at night, and when you see it, it's, it's the moonlight or the sunlight reflecting off of this. Now I know why these, why these satellites have to have these gold and, and aluminum reflective surfaces. Because they are maintaining the lie, fraud, illusion. Oh, look at the satellite up in the sky. You see the sun reflect off of it? There it is. But you don't see the tether. You don't see this dark colored black balloon floating in the nighttime sky. So here's what the guy says. About how many balloons would you be looking for at one time? Mitchell says the number would depend on the balloons identified in a daily mission. Frag order, fragmentary operations order. Their codes would be listed. So each one of these balloons has a frequency and a code. This guy's saying, I think it was 10,000 feet the beacons would, would continue to function. We, can, we thought that, that they went down and were in the snow in the Brooks Range or, or some of the other mountains up in Alaska. He says, did your unit tell the tell you the purpose or the mission of the genetics while you were doing this? He says, yeah, we knew. The balloons were launched from Norway. Look at this, people. The balloons were, were launched from Norway, Denmark, West Germany, and I think some from Turkey. 
in the winter, February of 1956, there was an article in Time magazine about the Russians complaining about our overflight of the Soviet Union with these balloons. Holy shit, people. I mean, really. The Russians were complaining about the U.S. flying over the Soviet Union with balloons. The Russians were complaining about overflights of, of the Soviet Union with balloons. They had any number of gondolas stacked in the Sperodonfka Palace driveway of foreign ministry. Molotov. It was just unbelievable. He had many of them. What they're describing here is this. The Soviets ended up capturing a shitload of these fucking balloons the U.S. was sending up in the air. And they would literally send their aircraft up to capture them and bring them down. Now, you got to think about this, people. <laughs> this is absolutely mind-blowing. You're trying to tell me that we've been spending trillions of dollars for over 60 years for a satellite program they claim is going up on a rocket, and it's just a balloon you can buy from a hobby shop? Oh, my God. This is incredible. An interesting fact, the airplane I flew during the corona program had many recoveries of balloons than any airplane in the 456 wing. It was flown by Captain Slaughter Mims. And I think Slaughter recovered three balloons near Japan. He got more than anyone else. Slaughter had a lot of success. And he's describing the same aircraft that this guy flew. Okay? Here you go. This guy, Macaulay says, how, sex how successful was the Genetrix program? Mitchell says, none of the pilots associated with the project was ever permitted to see any of the genetic film that was recovered. The film was stored in the vaults at Air University at Maxwell Air Force Base, the last I heard. I was at Air University Film Library in 1957, and I asked if I could see the film, but they wouldn't let me because I didn't have need to know about it. Outwardly, I understood that, this, that it was a fair success. We knew more about the Russians than we would have without genetics. It wasn't, but it wasn't good enough to continue with in the conjunction with the U-2. It was like the U-2 wasn't as good as Discoverer. I have a document and a study on genetics done by a gentleman up in Minnesota. It gives the number that was recovered. A lot of the gondolas went into the water and were never recovered. They had a saltwater plug in them that dissolved when the plug came in contact with the water and eventually sank the gondola. That's what they say. That's what they say. Now, get this. Macaulay says... Did the public ever see the genetics gondolas and, and think they were UFOs? Mitchell says, I never heard of any reports of that nature, if there were any. There could be, there could have been, I don't know. You know, it's been so long since that operation, I don't recall any newspapers that might have said that they were UFOs. I know you could see the balloon. Listen to what he says. He says, I know you could, you could see the balloon very easily from the ground. It looked, here you go, people, smoke and gun. It looked about like a silver dollar during the daytime because you couldn't see anything attached to it. You see this for yourself, people. He said it looked, you could see it from the ground, and it looked like a silver dollar during the daytime because you couldn't see anything attached to it. So for all those naysayers out there that claim they've seen the Hubble, they've seen the ISS, they've seen other satellites and shit floating around in the sky, Think about this. That reflection that you see with the sun reflecting off of the aluminum surface or whatever type of aluminum, whatever type of shiny reflective material they're using for these satellites, carried by the jet stream flying around a specific territory that is tasked to fly around in. Macaulay says, at that time, did you normally call the program Dragnet or Genetrix? Mitchell says, we call the Dragnet. Genetrix was a classified code name for the program like Corona and Discoverer. Dr. Alvin H. Howell was the brains behind the balloon program. There you go. They lost one of these, okay? They lost one of the Corona satellites on a balloon, okay? This is a letter written to the Deputy Director for Science and Technology at the National Reconnaissance Office, okay? This was released, declassified and released by the National Reconnaissance Office, November 26th of 1997. 
in accordance with executive order, I think that's 12958. Subject, Corona Mission 1005 Incident. This memorandum is for, the, for information only. Corona Mission 1005 was launched on 27 April into orbit. Orbit? It was, they're considering orbit to be space. We know it ain't fucking space, all right? But that's moved. Let's continue on. Recovery attempts commencing to May were unsuccessful. Attached here to is a chronology of operational reporting received on this mission. Number three, on August 5th, OSA received word from its security representative at the Air Force Base, Los Angeles, that a satellite capsule had been reported as coming down near the venezuelan colombia border. The actions taken by OSA upon receipt of this information are detailed in a separate attachment. As a result of the investigation by the OSA in conjunction with the Caracas station and the embassy attache office there, the following facts are noted. Listen to this. August 1st. First word was received by Caracas Army Attaché Office of finding of a capsule at La Fria, 500 miles southwest of Caracas in a remote region of the Andes. August 3rd, reconfirmation of capsule finding made by telephone call to Caracas Embassy. August 4th, representatives of the embassy viewed capsule at San Cristobal to which it had been moved by political police. First press stories appeared. August 5th, capsule flown by host government to Caracas. August 6th to the 10th, capsule held by Minister of Defense of Venezuela. All right, August 8th, team from headquarters arrived at Caracas consisting of a security officer and a technical officer from the OSA office and a technical officer from the National Reconnaissance Office. August 10th, capsule turned over to embassy, examined and reports made by the headquarters team. Copies of pertinent cables on technical and security aspects attached. August 12th, security officer scheduled to return capsule to West Coast. August 6th to the 12th, for the record, it should be noted that on Thursday 6th, August, a request was made by the CIA to the NRO to convene a meeting of the Interdepartmental Contingency Planning Committee to assess the problems, coordinate procedures, and assign responsibility for responding to any news media queries which might arise. Now, what's interesting about this, they noticed there was a label that, that, that there was a a secret um, label on a satellite. It was marked secret. They removed that classification from it. This is regarding the history of satellite reconnaissance, volume 2A, Samos. Remember that name, Samos, okay? The Samos satellite, because here's what I'm gonna take you to next. This is the list of all balloon launches from the Isrange Space Center in Sweden. Okay? Now, let me take you, let me take you to the Swedish Space Center. And here is the Swedish Space Center website. This is the Swedish Space Center. And as you can see, they have balloons and rockets, payloads. This is their website. This is their website. Swedish. The Swedes. Okay? It's the Swedes. Here's their space center. They do balloon launches. Now, let me take you the document I downloaded from their website. Now, this is a list of balloon launches from the Astron Space Center starting December 9th of 1982. Remember that term? Samos? You can read these documents for yourselves. We don't need to keep going through all this stuff together. I put a lot of this shit out for you people so that you can see this. You see they talk about weather satellite program, mapping satellite program, realignment controversy, new directions in satellite reconnaissance, okay? But let me take you to this document, which is very important from the Swedes. This is not U.S. oriented. I got this from a foreign country, okay? So you look at some of the launches. These, these are balloon launches, people. These ain't rockets. It says it, list of balloon launches. There's going to be some things here that you may see that are going to catch your eye, all right? Because I want you to look. You see the campaign, you look at the payload, all right? 
You got campaigns and payloads. And we're not going to go through all these codes, but you're going to see something that's going to catch your attention. All right? We're going to keep going through this. All right? Keep going through it. You're going to see something that's going to catch your attention that's going to blow your mind. You see this, people? What does that say? Mirror. That's the Mir space module, February 24th, 1997. Here goes another one, Mir, March 17th, 1997, Mir. Okay, I want you to see these things, all right? I want you to see these things. Let me take you to another one here, because there's a, uh, let me, um, hang on. Let me see. Here we go. Two more. Mir. February 18th, February 19th, 1999. Mir. It's the Mir space module, people. On a balloon. The ISS does not exist complete the way they show it on television. Here goes another one. Mir. On a balloon. What they are showing you of the space station is a computer-generated image they are not showing you the complete module put together, flying at 17,000 miles an hour. Here you go. Look at this. Support mirror. They sent up a support balloon to resupply the mirror on a balloon. On a balloon, people. Look at this. Orion. Orion payload. Look at here. In Marsat. You want to know where your satellite uh, phone communications come from? A balloon, people. A balloon. I'll supply this document to whoever wants it. Here we go. Immersat test. Balloon. If you were to take time to search every single one of these flights to match it up with a particular rocket launch that they claim this thing was on, I guarantee you you will be able to compare it with this Swedish Isran Space Center balloon flight list. Balloon flight list. Balloons, people. That's your program. It's always been your program. Look at this. Mere short duration. Mere VLD. Me, you got two VLD. Look at here. More mere. This is in 2002, people. 2002. Every, for those in Europe, you ever heard of Enviasat? Look at Enviasat. Enviasat. These things are supposed to be testing the atmosphere for particulates and, you know, for pollution control. Balloons, people. You, you, you just, you can't come to any other conclusion. You don't have any other information to prove you were at the launch pad and you saw them put this thing inside the nose cone of a rocket. You didn't see it. You can work for NASA, you can work for the Germans, you can work for the Russians. You did not see what you thought you saw going into a nose cone of a capsule and with, with, a, with an unedited video stream and put on a launch pad and launched into the sky on a rocket. You didn't see that. Look at NASA. Why is NASA using why is NASA using the Swedish to launch a balloon for them? Think about that. They're everywhere, people. They're carrying out the deception, the fraud, the hoax, the scam, the bullshit. It's all here. It's all here, people. I keep saying it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. You can talk about it all day long. You can claim this is your theory, this is your hypothesis. You ain't got no documentation to, to fucking back it up. You just want to show some bullshit video and you're not a videographer and you don't know how to do video analysis. You got to get the documentation. And here's the documentation right here. NASA, 2011, LED, ESO, high wind. Just check these out. Because I have. NASA, 2003, 2013, Sunrise 2. Look at that. Balloon. Balloon, people. That's a complete list. It goes all the way to 2014. 2014, people. 2014. There you have it. There you have it, people. 
I don't know what else to tell you. I really don't know what else to tell you. Check this out. Just check this shit out. Check this shit out. Another satellite being launched from Antarctica. Check this out. You're going to love this one. That's Antarctica, people. Remember how we saw that circular launch pad? The bulldozer is smoothing out the, the ice and snow. Look at this. Just wait and see. Watch this. <laughs> this is McMurdo Station in the background. McMurdo is right back here. They have line of sight to this airstrip. Just look at this. This is your billion trillion dollar fucking satellite program. A goddamn fucking balloon. A balloon, people. It goes fucking 20, 30 million dollars on a balloon. It's not inside a fucking rocket nose cone. There you go. Woohoo! Woohoo! Yay! Hey. Now you want to know what NASA is spending all that fucking money for on helium? NASA has spent a shitload of money on helium. So you got to ask yourself. What the fuck is all that helium for, right? You think, okay, maybe it's for the vacuum chamber. They're doing all kinds of testing. No, bullshit. That fucking helium is so it's for their fucking balloon program. What else would you use fucking helium for? What would you use helium for? You use fucking helium to fucking float. It's at 18,000 feet right now. Come on, people. This, this, this common sense. This common fucking logic. Hey, the payload is now at a hundred and five thousand feet. Look at that, hundred and five thousand feet. Quite well, even with the naked eye, it's nice and well inflated now. So, based on the size of that balloon, now well, we're at about one hundred twenty thousand feet. Look at that. So these things got to get to at least 150, maybe 100, maybe maybe they can get to about 180,000 feet. But at nighttime, see this fucking thing. You're not going to see it. You're not going to see the satellite, period. So we're going to go to aircraft. So let's go to the U2 Dragon Lady. Let's go to the U2 product card. Okay, so here's your U2. I can tell you here right now, this is a new upgrade in addition. They've upgraded the satellite system. So instead of, they're still using balloons, okay? They're still using balloons. But as far as military, advanced communications, topography, mapping, this platform 
33 of these are stationed around the world. 33 of them. Half of them are flown unmanned. Half of these can be flown without pilots inside of them. They can fly 24 hours. They can be refueled in the air at high altitude. They've, they've got everything on board that you would need to do the same communications on the ground. 15 of these can be flown without pilots, unmanned. When I spoke to my professor who used to be a defense intelligence agency officer, he was in charge of the U-2 ISR program, Intelligence Surveillance and Crimes program. I asked him how many of these would be needed to cover the entire earth in a 24 hour period. He told me, you only need 10. You could map, you could cover the entire earth and your satellite photos that you guys see, satellite imagery, high altitude imagery that they claim is coming from the ISS. The U2 is taking the high definition photographs and they're being presented as ISS fo footage. Don Pettit told you in the tyranny of the rocket equation, there ain't no fucking way humans ever left the fucking earth. They ain't never left the fucking earth in the space. This is it right here. Period. Period. So let's look at this document. I want to blow this up for you guys here. So let's do this. It says here, and I want to go specific to the technical cap capabilities. Okay. Let's do this. It says here, look at the maximum cruise speed. Actually, no, the cruise speed is 475 miles an hour. Now, that's completely contradictory to what we have learned and been told with regard to high altitude aeronautics, that the higher you go, the faster you got to go to maintain aeronautic stability and control. But it seems here that the cruising speed for the U-2S is 475 miles an hour. There's less atmosphere at altitude. But this is where people get confused when you see all the videos. It says the ceiling is above 70,000 feet. Above 70,000 feet, people. The max altitude of U-2 is not 70,000. The ceiling is above 70,000. The range is greater than 6,000 miles. Which means if the cruising speed of U-2 is at 475 miles an hour and it can go above 70,000 feet, that means that there's definitely atmosphere that is breathable. You can operate in it above 70,000 feet. And you can you use less fuel at 475 miles an hour above 70,000 feet. This is the cruise speed. Maximum weight, 40,000 pounds. So would you think maybe possibly they could put some sort of hot advanced optical scope on this bad boy? Because the Hubble was 27,000 pounds. Maximum weight of this is 40,000 pounds. So how much advanced imagery and communication equipment you think you can put on this platform? It's twice the, the, it's twice the mass of Hubble flying at above 70,000 feet. Here it is right here. And look at the price. Here's what's interesting to me, the coincidence, people. The Hubble, they claim, cost $1.5 billion. The Hubble, $1.5 billion. Look what it says here. The recent $1.58 billion in system upgrades includes sensor upgrades, improves, improves radar, multi-spectrum imaging, and signals collection sensors and data links, a new F-118 GE-101 engine, improves range and altitude, lowers operating costs, and reduces weight by 12%. Glass cockpit, new defensive suite, improves survivability against the late, latest generation of missile and fighter threats. One point five eight billion. The Hubble, one point five eight billion. 
Sophia, 1.5 billion. That's the magic number for a lot of this bullshit. $1.5 billion is the number these government agencies are using. It's probably costing, it's probably costing half of this and the other half of going in the fucking pockets of your fucking Senate and congressional fucking representatives and their fucking contracting companies who are building this bullshit and telling you, oh no, it's all going up on a fucking rocket. It says here, reconnaissance and surveillance from the stratosphere. The stratosphere. Everything we know of, communications, tele, you know, uh, imagery, you name it. Everything is stays within the stratosphere, which means we can't get beyond the thermosphere. We can't get there. We can't get there. This is our limitation. We can't go beyond this technological capability because we just can't get out there. We can't get there, people. When they say the U-2 flies at the edge of space, the edge of space, I'm sorry to tell you. The edge means you're maybe within five to 10,000 feet of the Kármán line, which is 328,000 feet. How the hell could you be up in the U-2 be on the edge of space? The edge of what space? You mean the next space, which is from the stratosphere is the mesosphere and then the thermosphere? Because maybe they're on the edge of the mesosphere. Or the thermos, they ain't close to the thermosphere because it's too goddamn hot up there. It's in excess of 500 degrees Fahrenheit. You honestly think that this aircraft would be able to withstand those heat temperatures? Look at the SR-71. They tried to take it up there and look what happened to it. I do believe you have to fly faster the higher you go, but we can't do it. It's that simple. It's that simple. To me, it's that simple. It really is, people. To me, it's that simple. That's the presentation, people.